and for our future as a congregation. We need to figure out the giftedness of this congregation right now. What has God gifted us with so that we might more effectively minister and do outreach? We have to have a vision, and the only way to capture that vision is, of course, to take the prayer to God as well, too. So we will certainly include that in our personal prayers as well as our church prayers, and pray that God would inspire those members of the church to bring their talents and gifts, the Holy Spirit given gifts that they have received from God because of their relationship with Christ, and to bring those together as we seek our future together as a church. Also, a couple of other announcements this Wednesday is youth group. I noticed that today was also supposed to be Sunday school. I did not even do any preparation for that. Can we do that next week? And we'll make sure the other kids uh, see if we can get the other kids here in these next couple of weeks. And uh, so we will do that. Uh, so no Sunday school today, but we will get Sunday school next week. So we're moving things a little differently. Let me see. As far as other announcements go, one uh, major person concern, and that is... Uh, we had a, it wasn't a member, he never joined the congregation, but always related to the congregation, a 92-year-old gentleman named Ernie Shira, and uh, you, do you know that name? I mean, you might be the only person who might recognize that. And he, he lived uh, uh, down uh, towards uh, the gas station on Sunnyside uh, in East Pittsburgh. At any rate, he was, uh, his family were members down at Hebron Lutheran Church, and uh, they uh, after the church closed, many of them, some of them joined, some of them did not. They just kind of sat there, and he was one of those that never officially joined the church, but he always been connected to the church in some way. Anyway, his funeral was yesterday, and a uh, 92-year-old, and uh, we just give thanks for him. He's a very wonderful, wonderful man and wonderful family. We just give thanks for his life today and uh, his opportunity to be reunited with his wife and his loved ones have gone before. I think he was ready, and so we give thanks for that. Are there other announcements or people concerns that need to be mentioned today? Then let us prepare our hearts. We invite you to stand as we make confession before the Lord. Today we might, uh, instead of the confession of forgiveness, let's turn over to the next page and do the Thanksgiving for baptism today. And uh, that is a little surprise. I'm sorry, Paul, I did not announce that to you. And I hope you don't take offense at that. But I would like to do that today since we are in the Easter season. So let us turn. I think it's page 96, correct? 97. 97. All right. Page 97. We begin our service today in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So we are joined together in Christ in the waters of holy baptism and clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of holy baptism this day. We give thanks to you, O God, for we know that in the beginning your Holy Spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery to freedom. And at the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. It is by water and word that you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains all life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ, showered upon us with your Holy Spirit. And you renew our lives, therefore, with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor, praise through Jesus Christ our Lord. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us sing together, opening him, good Christian friends, rejoice and sing.
Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Once again, another change. We would, I would like to do that. This is the feast today, which is the next page over. And so we begin with this is the feast rather than the glory to God. Here is the lesson. Let us read responsibly. 
the 133rd Psalm. How good and how pleasant it is when children live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head, falling down upon the beard. Upon the beard of Aaron, falling down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon, flowing down upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing. Jesus, 
who gets who Jesus truly is. Did you hear his confession? Peter said, oh, Jesus, you're the Messiah. Good on you, Peter. But there's one step further Peter didn't go. Thomas gets all the way there. My Lord and, did you hear what he said? My God. Thomas is the very first person who gets who this Jesus truly is because he realized his resurrection from the dead. That's not a very common thing. In fact, the only person that can do that is God. Oh, Jesus must be God, right? Come to us and living amongst us. We also miss something in context with this lesson. Jesus never indicts Peter. We interpret it that way. We think Jesus is saying, shame on you, Peter. I can't believe you didn't believe me. We don't take this lesson in the entire context. What happened just before Jesus revealed himself to the disciples? Everybody, Sam's Thomas. Oh, they were witnessed to by the women. And what happened? None of them believed. Right? So we sit here and we say, oh, I can't believe Thomas didn't believe. Well, sorry, none of the other apostles believed either when they heard the testimony of the women. They had to also see Jesus and touch him and feel him, and yet Thomas is the one that we give a bad rap to. Come on. Really? I will be frank with you. If somebody told me that Jesus rose from the dead and I were one of his disciples, I'd kind of have to see it to believe it too because call me Missouri on the show me state. I need to see it, touch it, to feel it, to believe it, right? Don't we all? There's absolutely nothing wrong with Thomas. But Jesus does use Thomas as an example. But he's never indicted of Thomas. He understands that he needs to touch and see it. When he does say, Jesus goes on and says, but blessed are those who don't have the privilege and opportunity to see me, to touch me and feel me, and yet believe in me still. Who would he be referring to? It's all of you. You are especially blessed because you don't have the privilege like Thomas did and all the other disciples of touching, seeing, and feeling him, but yet here we are, we believe. And so I would say to you, if Thomas himself struggled and wrestled, we too, who do not see Jesus, will also struggle and wrestle sometimes with our faith. We will sometimes, are you ready? <clears throat> doubt. Any of you doubt? I'm outright telling you, I doubt. Many times. You know who one of the people who brought me back to faith? That person right there. Lori. She doesn't know it. I don't want to share all this story, but she came to me one time because I was wrestling with some things, and she said, I'm going to tell you something that you told me when I was wrestling with things. We are going to have faith for you when I was wrestling with some things. She gave me a big hug. So thank you for that. <laughs> she doesn't remember. It made a huge impression on me. Faith is not the absence of doubt. We all doubt things, but we take a step forward. Regardless of our doubt, faith is an action. It's not a feeling or a squishy thing in the pit of our stomach. It's something that we do despite the fact that we are wrestling with doubts and worries and concerns. That's what makes it faith. We don't know that God exists. We believe that God exists. We take a step forward as though God exists even though we wrestle with these things. The evidence is not always clear. I'm just, uh, with my thesis, one of the things I'm, I, I, I'm reading is this guy named Chuck Colson. I, you know, if, if you don't know who he is, he was actually part of uh, the Nixon administration was a part of the big cover-up that led to Watergate. Well, he's since come to have his Jesus moment where he's come to faith and now he's spent the last uh, 30, 40 years of his life writing about the proof that there is a God and so forth. Well, good on him. I've read his books. There's no proof that there is a God. There isn't. You can't prove to me by scientific evidence that God exists. I'm sorry, you can look at that and you can interpret all that information a different way. It's a step of faith. 
Everything that he shares is just an anecdote that could be interpreted scientifically or some other way. I'm not trying to cast doubt, but what I am trying to say is we accept that the sun rises and the beauty of the day and all the birds and the animals and the, the crops in the field and the goodness that does exist in the world is evidence of God. Well, it's not really evidence of God, but we accept it and interpret it as though it's something that God has given to us. We accept it by, what's that word again? Faith. But I can't prove to you that God is the one that did it. I accept it by faith that the goodness of this world is a gift of God. So the evidence is not always clear, but we accept it by faith and we take a step ahead, believing that it is God that has blessed us with his presence through the goodness of this world and through the blessing of relationship with each other. And so what Jesus does at the end of the lesson for today, he gives Thomas and all the apostles his peace through the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that Holy Spirit will be passed on to us, and that is what ultimately leads us to believe. I don't know that there's a God. I believe that there is a God, and I take a step forward every single day in that belief. But here's what sustains me. And so this is where we go to the next page for those with the handout. For those that are online, I didn't forget to post it today. For that, I apologize. Here's what keeps me going in those moments when I wrestle with my faith. It's those grace moments of life that God gives to me upon which I feast on a regular basis. I just pointed to one, Lord. But she's not the only one. I've had another young man the other day who was part of our Revolution Church when we were out in Greensburg who just sent me out of the blue a little message on Facebook. He said, I just wanted to tell you how grateful I am for you. It's been, I know it's been 10 years, but he said, I was just talking about you the other day. I was just reminded about what I learned and how grateful I am for you. I just thought that maybe you wanted, would want to hear that and maybe that would sustain you a little bit. Well, that was really cool. Unexpected. And you never know when you need those types of stories to feast on, right? Take those. I actually have a thing called the Happy Five. I take an excerpt of those things, I print them off, and I put them in there, and I read them on occasion to remind myself that we've made a difference. And it keeps me going in the hard times. I'll tell you what else keeps me going. People of faith who've walked through disastrous situations and times in their life. You are, may or may not be aware of it. We have had several members in our church who've lost children, grandchildren. We have one family that's lost two grandchildren and a daughter. Oh, how in the world do they get up every single day? It would kill me. I don't know how you would do it. But they're such an inspiration to me. Somehow they get up every single day and they keep going. They just inspire me. And for them, it's a matter of we have to somehow make their life worthwhile by keeping on going. I'm like, I don't know how you do it, but they are such an inspiration to me. So people have lived through disastrous things. They encourage me when I go through, when I stub my toe and I think the world's falling down. I'm like, oh, I stub my toe. Oh, really, come on. That's nothing. God will sustain us. I will also tell you the great men and women of faith in history who have died for their relationship with Christ, never having seen the work of their labor come to fruition. Moses was one, right? He never saw all of that uh, come to fruition, everything that he'd done. He died out in the middle of the desert, never entered into the promised land. But he's not the only one. History is filled with people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was willing to die for his faith, never seen the freedom for which he fought. But he's willing to give his life for the cause of Christ. Now you notice on my list, not one person who is willing to kill for Jesus. I have no respect for any Christian who kills in the name of Jesus Christ or uses political force to impose their will upon other people. I am going to take a very unpopular opinion. I think Constantine was one of the worst things that ever happened to the Church of Jesus Christ. Because Constantine supposedly converted to his relationship with Christ and then took all the force 
parts of Roman law and force everybody to be a Christian. That's horrible. We see that happening in our country today. People want to force people to believe certain things. We got a... <laughs> okay, now I'm on a soapbox. I'm sorry. I'll make this quick. We've got a, a guy who's the head of the education department in Oklahoma who wants to force every public school to pray a certain way before school every day. I find that horrendous because they're all Southern Baptists. I don't mind that. That's fine. But imagine your teachers are Roman Catholic and wants to teach them how to make the sign of the cross. I got no problems with that. But I bet you those Southern Baptists would. Right? So what is this guy trying to do? Force Southern Baptist prayer upon every school kid, some of whom might be Muslim, some of whom might be atheists, some might be this. Why are we using the force of law to push Christianity down folks? I'd like to say, hey, look, you take your kids home, you go to your own church and have your own church teach your kids how to pray, and you should be teaching your kids how to pray in your house. That's not a problem. Public school teachers don't need that, right? They got enough to do. It's ridiculous. But we are using power of the law to force Christianity down people's throats. I don't have any respect for that. I respect the people, though, who are willing to die for their faith. That's a big difference. I respect those who are willing to sacrifice for their faith. Those are the folks that sustain I am sustained by people who are absolutely brilliant minds who believe despite the, what seemed to be the foolishness of faith. Rudolf Bultmann, you keep, I keep mentioning he's one of my great heroes. What you may not know, you might have seen that movie Oppenheimer recently. I, I, I'm not sure I can watch it. I don't know. But what most people don't know, Oppenheimer was a Jew. How did he get out of Germany? because of Rudolf Bultmann. I'm not sure what Rudolf Bultmann would have thought of the nuclear bomb or the atomic bomb, but because I think he was always against that type of violence. But Rudolf Bultmann literally helped thousands of Jews escape out of uh, Nazi Germany. He's an amazing man. We don't ever hear of this guy. But he was a brilliant scholar. I find those grace moments, those faith moments when I get the encouragement of other Christians. And oftentimes because I may not always believe, I may wrestle with my belief in God, but I, I do what I certainly do believers the same. Right? He's in my face all the time. And so there must be a God. And then the very last thing, what does Jesus give to the disciples at the end? The Holy Spirit. Because when I wrestle with my faith, I know that I've got the Holy Spirit interceding on my behalf when I am at the end of my road. There is a really stupid Christian idea that God will never give you anything more than you can handle. Oh, trust me, you all know by now that's a lie. You've had times in your life where you're at the end of rope and you can't hold on anymore and you even let go. That's when God is there through the Holy Spirit to grab you. Life can be hard. It can be filled with a lot of doubts. It doesn't make you an awful person. That's just a normal part of our journey. But this I do promise, even when you come to the end of the rope and you can no longer hold on, it is the Holy Spirit who will grab you and sustain you. Let us give thanks. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for the gift of the Holy Spirit this day. Because there are days where I've just been at my wit's end. And yeah, God, I've had more than I can handle. Contrary to that popular unchristian belief, honestly. But the promise of a relationship with God is that even in our times of despair, desperation, and doubt, you come and pick us up with the gift of your Holy Spirit through the witness of other Christians who have been through these challenging days. And so God, let us continue to stay together, witness to each other, love each other, care for each other, so that we might be sustained even in our times of doubt. 
So I thank you for Thomas, that witness of a great Christian faith. And I'm so thankful for him. I'm hoping he knows today that I respect him. And I hope he knows that uh, not all of us remember him just for one moment, fleeting moment of doubt. But we just give you thanks for his witness in Jesus' name. Amen. Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiping the Lord. 
glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks again for the mercies that you've showered upon us this day. Another beautiful day. And we've been hammered by a lot of rain, not just here in Pittsburgh, but throughout the country. We know it's created some challenges, but we do pray that as these waters recede, we thank you, hopefully, God, that our, our ground can at least maintain some of that water. Our water tables can be replenished, especially in places where they've had uh, minimal water in recent years. We just pray your continued uh, feeding of the ground for the purposes that it might be productive in the uh, spring. And we just pray that you bless our farmers as they start preparing these lands that they might produce for us. We give you thanks for their efforts. For we know that they work tirelessly from this, for this, the beginning of this season. We also thank you, God, for uh, the, the, the hope that you've given us in Christ. We thank you for Ernie uh, Shira, who uh, died just the other day, for the wonderful testimony of faith and life that he lived. He was such an inspiration to his family and inspiration to me. But we pray that you sustain his family because there's not a one of them who can imagine a day without him. So we pray that you would sustain them all with your spirit in their time of need. For those, Lord, who struggle with heartache and pain, with those who are struggling with physical ailments, we pray for them and lift them to you as well. For Carrie and Noah, Rocco and Tina and Jackie and Ari and Carissa and Jeff and Judy and Joanne and Cheryl. We give thanks that she's doing much better for Jim and Mikey. We also lift up those with cancer. Our list seems to grow longer. These are many of whom are related to our congregation in some way. And we just prove and that's okay. That's what we're here to do. To support and pray for those who are here today concerned about their family members. And so we lift them up today for John and Bob, Mike and Pam, Joseph, Sam, Mikey, Yazzie, Pauline, Dorothy, Gail, Ron, and all those who need your presence this day. We pray that you would sustain them and be with their families that are here today praying for them. All of us, it seems to have somebody on this list for whom we are concerned. And so we just ask you to comfort those of us who are concerned and that you will be with us too. We also lift up this world that, uh, again, the wars of this world for Ukraine, for Israel and Gaza, that you will bring safety and end to the chaos and restore your peace. Because only your peace ultimately will last. Human-made peace only lasts for a season. We also lift up our partners in faith, especially our Bishop Wilma Kuchar, our presiding Bishop Elizabeth Eaton. We also thank you for our pastors in our Slovak Zion Synod and those pastors in our congregations locally and for the people that serve so faithfully. We pray for man at the new day and St. John as well, that you might continue to sustain them and Help us to grow deeper in our relationship with each other so that we might sustain each other as well. For church goes beyond the boundaries of Holy Trinity, Lutheran. Church is all who call upon the name of Christ. And Lord, whatever else is on our hearts and minds, we just take this opportunity to silent prayer to lift all of these concerns to you this day. In your hands, O oh Lord, we commit all those for whom we pray, and we trust in your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Also, will we please share a sign of peace with your brothers and sisters. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. It is through your goodness, 
You have blessed us and all the gifts that we've gathered together today, ourselves, our time, our possessions. Use us in what we have gathered in and feeding the world with your love to the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed our right, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times, in all places, give thanks to you, and make and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so it is with Mary Magdalene, with Peter, with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus bless us and keep us in his grace and peace now and forever. Let us pray. God of abundance it is with this bread of life and cup of salvation that you've united us with Jesus Christ, making us one with all of your people. Send us forth this day in the power of your Holy Spirit that we might proclaim your redeeming love to this world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now receive the Lord's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you in favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us sing together a closing hymn.
Yeah, it might be. Uh, I just, this is not a part of my tradition, but I, I'm glad we did it today. I'm sorry we didn't get to this. Uh, it really is not that hard to say. But, yeah, all right. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us. We'll see you later.